all your life, whether living or deceased, He's still your Father. You cannot refute that. What do you remember most about your father while we're waiting on Elder Blue to come right back up? What do you remember most about your father? Hmm. There's so many things. Well, I remember um, one distinct memory I have is I was home from spring break and I had the opportunity to make this bed with my dad. And we really didn't, you know, have much bonding time, but that time that me and my dad built that bed together was a time that I'll never forget because we did it together. Like he helped me, you know, I was like, no son, do this, put this part together. And I was learning and we were both, you know, learning each other. And so that's the distinct memory I have of us building that bed together. Wow, that is so nice. And how old are you, Timothy? 23. And that's one of the most fondest memories you have of your father. Fantastic. Yeah, uh, the blues back in. Um, I would be remiss if I did not mention that the man that I call father, my grandfather, my father passed when I was four, but I did not have any gaps or had any opportunity to say I missed him because I had a powerful grandfather that I called father. And every Father's Day, I think about him as a provider, a protector. He was a businessman, a phenomenal husband, a phenomenal protector. I didn't have need or lack of anything. Great provider and left me land and monies that I'm still living off today. So my grandfather, John Emmanuel Sweet, is my idea of a husband, my idea of a father, a provider, a protector. He just gave me a great picture of Daddy God. What do you remember most about your father? Well, what I remember, ooh. He was tall like me, wore glasses like me. He wore overalls, all that old stuff. He was a country boy, but one thing I remember about my father, he was a man of his word, and you didn't play with him. <laughs> well, I mean, didn't play. I mean, you said what you're going to do, and he believed what you're going to do, so that's what I mean by playing. But one thing I know about my, my, my father, there's a lot of us blue boys, a lot of us, so when you mess with one of us, my daddy would show up. Don't mess with my children. And that was his reputation in the community because when you see one blue, you're seeing all of them. We look so much alike, you think we part, not only quad trip, but I mean nine of us look alike. Because when you look at one, say, I just seen that one. I just seen that one. But what I like about my daddy, he was true to his word. Yeah. And you mentioned something this morning. You, should, you got up and you said you got dressed and looked in the mirror. And what happened? I got up and got dressed. And I... People throughout the neighborhood said, boy, you look just like your daddy. Then I'm thinking, I got nine more brothers. They got to look more like my daddy than me. So I started looking at myself, and I saw a picture in my mind, and I am the spitting image of him. Not only that, I want to look like my daddy God, too, because we made it in the and Lightning. But as we transition, would you come and join me, Pastor Dave, in these seats? We want to do a different type of service today. This is a picture of four generations of Davids. Four generations. His daddy, and then himself, and then David Gerard, and David Antonio. Four generations of Davids. Do you mind sharing with the congregation what you remember about your daddy? You're always talking about your mother. I thought all of yesterday. He's always talking about his mother, but he rarely talks about his father. Inquiry minds want to know, what are your fondest memories about your father and how he impacted your life? He impact, The reason I have good credit, the reason I pay people, the reason... Uh, it's because of my dad, even on his deathbed, he was saying, boy, don't you, p make sure you pay people back. So it carried over to the point that I don't like debt and I pay debt off. So that's one of the main things that he did. He was born in the 1800s, so he was not a dad that I could play with and do that kind of thing, but uh, a good father, a good loving father, got along with everybody, crazy, joking, that kind of thing. So you're comedian side came from your father? I guess so. I guess I borrowed it from him. So, uh, like I said, born in the 1800s and owned uh, uh, properties, 
houses all over the place. I found out after he died, he was a bail bondsman. I didn't know what we were doing when I would, we would go pick people up from jail and take them home. I didn't know that he was a bail bondsman until that time. So was your father romantic? No, not at all. <laughs> I, never, I never saw mom and dad kiss, never saw them hold hands, never saw mom sit in dad's lap, never saw them hug, no, never saw them touch. But they did something because I'm here. <laughs> Wow. Okay. Well, on that same note, how generous was your father? Very stingy. Very stingy. That's all you'll say about Very that? Very stingy. <laughs> when I asked him for money, he turned it back and handed me a dollar or two. Very stingy. Mm. Had plenty of money, but very stingy. Mm -hmm. So I'm fighting that. So those are, those are generational blessings and generational Being struggles. Being stingy can be a blessing and could be a curse. The blessing part of it is you, you're careful how you spend money. You think about what you're spending. You don't just spend because somebody else is spending. But on the good part, it, I save money. I don't like not saving money. I don't like not storing up money. So we have 401ks. We have money set aside because of the training I got from my dad. He always had a savings account. So did you appreciate that as a child or resent that? I resented up? it because I had holes in my shoes and when it rained, my socks got wet. Is that a joke or are you No, serious? that's truth. He was so stingy on that side that he didn't buy things that he should have bought. So I had to get a balance in that area. Wow. No, seriously. Seriously, so how did you overcome that? I overcame it by having a wife that stayed on my nerves and uh, talking in my ear and prophesied in my ear. That calling me, calling me stingy and <laughs> that kind of thing. I had a wife that helped push me out of it. And what, what really broke me from it was we would be in church and people would do offerings and I would get a headache because they would ask them for my dollar. Or they would ask them for more than a dollar, but... I would get headaches because I said they shouldn't take up offerings and I watched her take money from the family and give it and saw God multiply back and said, oh, this thing works. So that broke it. Mm. Wow. I'm kind of speechless at this point. Like, wow, I was there, but you never realize what drives people or make them the way that they are. You're a very, very successful man, and I greatly admire and applaud all that you have done. I was looking at Terry because Terry's last, uh, two weeks ago when we showed the videos of all the places we moved, he said, boy, you were poor. <laughs> <laughs> and I, didn't, I thought about it after he said that, and he was right. We moved to so many places. We, we were preaching prosperity, preaching the gospel, had food stamps, staying in a place that was $25 a month, and still didn't hardly have any money. And the man that we were working for paid me $100 a week and wanted part of that back in offerings. Mm -hmm. So had it I, not been for the Lord on our side, yeah. wow. But in 1987, it broke. The mindset changed and things broke and things began to spring up. When it looked like, I don't know what we're going to do, we'll never have anything. In 1987, everything turned. And, it, it's been, and it's been that way since. It's been up, 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 up. And we've never been broke another day in our lives. Going down memory lane, I think, or this is my opinion, and you can tag in on that. I think the lack of faith had a lot to do with that. The reason we were, we're not fighting people that have to receive government assistance temporarily, or government housing temporarily, as long as you are not building a fence around it and making it your permanent uh, station your permanent place. Uh, we were on uh, food stamps because of the lack of faith, just not believing God. And I, one day I went in and said to him, I will not be going back down there and spoken to that way. I will not be disrespected quite often and the kind of things that, how people treat you, I'm educated, I don't have to tolerate this. And just once we cut that apron string and decided we're gonna trust God, and line our finances up and do the right thing, every, God started moving in our favor. 
Would you agree with that or disagree with that? I agree with that because uh, the thing about, I read a scripture uh, when I was in the doctor's office that dealt with being a pauper, being a poor person, and how it influences your, your life to the point that you hoard things, you, you have a fear of running out. So the fear of running out made me hold on to things that I shouldn't have held on to. It made, kept me from being blessed. And during the food, food stamp time, it was so, I never went, she went, and I was enjoying those shrimp and all that stuff we got with those food stamps. And I got so, that. He I, never got went. so I got so upset when she said she was not going back. I said, go back one more time. <laughs> I really did because I was enjoying the handout, knowing deep down inside we had no business trusting the government and, and being in that particular place. Mm -hmm. So after turning data loose and beginning to say, okay, God, let me see you do what you said you can do. Then we saw the difference. But I read a scripture in the doctor's office that talked in Proverbs that said, a king that's a poor man caused the earth to quake. Mm. It's, it's, it's the reason Moses had to be trained in Pharaoh's house rather than in Egypt. Because in Egypt, he would have been, he would have been a poor man trying to deliver people. So the whole different mindset when you have something helps you to be delivered on the inside so you can help deliver people externally. So being poor, uh, I preached a lot of things. I mean, I made a lot of mistakes, a lot of crazy errors because you preach according to how you feel. So some messages were, this is how I feel, so I think the other people feel that way. So a lot of it was not God, it was flesh because of where I was and where I lived and the mindset that I had. Let's go down memory lane for a few minutes. Oh, God. <laughs> I think this is so wonderful. I spent an entire day going through our photo album. I just dated myself going through our photo album. And we'll go to our first outfit together, <laughs> our first Easter together. That's three months of dating. The airman, the veteran, he was stationed at Tyndall Air Force Base and showing you the type of man he was, he decided for our first Easter, he would have us outfits made alike. So he purchased the top, we actually had jackets, I have other pictures, we have jackets to match those um, pants set that we had made just alike. That was the one of many things that he decided to have made to redress me. That's dating 1977 March. And moving right along from dating. Oh, there is the airman. Come on, guys, you need to stand and salute the armed forces. Air Force, he served at Tyndall, working in assignments, and never received an assignment. There's something fishy about that. I wanted to travel and see the world. He worked in assignments. No, I, I received an assignment, and when I did, they said, we're going to send you to Germany, and it would be 18 months before your wife can get there. And during that time, she was crazy. She said, if you go a year and a half, I'm going to date somebody while you're gone. <laughs> What's she crazy did. about that? She said, I'm going to date somebody, so I got out. <laughs> I see I don't have no help in here. All right, moving right along. The next picture, oh, well, he actually impregnated me. The next picture is a picture of me pregnant. But I'm fine with you not showing that. I'm good. Looks like I'm wearing a moo moo that I made myself. But that's a picture of him and David Gerard Rozier. David was, Gerard was just a month old. And then the very next picture, he's reading a bedtime story to his daddy. Puts his daddy off to sleep. <laughs> That's when his father learned how to read all those different books from Gerard reading to his daddy. <laughs> then the next picture, when Gerard turned exactly one, he was a year old. That's our Tyndall Air Force Base. We're on base housing there. And we started the Bible study there in our home. You can interject anytime you're ready. That first birthday party, first child. And then the very next picture, 
which is our first appreciation of house to house meeting. Fellowship Church of Praise, we were at Ike, so we were the fellowship at Ike and Lynette Holmes. If you notice Gerard is in the middle there, and you see the picture on the table. And it's actually, so it talks about the grateful people that we had around us and the family people that we are and were. And the next one is one of my favorite ones. Gerard is helping his daddy minister to the people. <laughs> and of course, Lester jumped in the picture. That is Lester Baltazar. <laughs> From house to house, and Gerard and his dad are ministering. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Moving right along, and the next picture. Two children later, Gerard and Byron. Remember, protect me when I start getting phone calls. They didn't, I didn't have the permission to show this. This is Gerard and Byron and their dad. Three children later, and that is a little Devron. In the crib. What was your favorite memory about Devron? I don't remember. Okay. <laughs> I really, I, no, I really don't. That bothers me sometimes. There was so much. Uh, uh, she would show me pictures and say, I don't remember that. And honestly, I, there's so much I don't remember. And some of it is because of the pain, early pain, that you block out some of the things. Hurt for things. Not that Devon was a hurt and all that, but some of the things around in my life during that time were painful. The ministry I was in was pain. The people I had to work for was pain. Mm. So the enemy really intended to take me out through a trail of frustrations. Uh, some of the same. When something started happening to you over and over and over and over to engrave it in your brain for you to start expecting bad instead of expecting good. And you, you'll get up looking for something bad rather than looking for something good. And that always caused you to have something bad because what you image and picture, you always have. So you always have what you didn't want to have. And what you, it's like you'd fight not to be like somebody, but you be like them because you got the image of them in front of you trying not to be them and not understand the concept of the scripture that I become that that I keep looking at. Mm. Although that's what I don't want to be, but I keep looking at what I don't want to be, so I become what I don't want to be. Mm. So you end up being just like your daddy, just like your mom, just like the cousin or whoever, because that's who you say, I ain't going to never be like them. And you got that in your mind, mm -hmm. yeah. and that's the picture you see. Mm -hmm. So you end up being the spitting image of them. Unless you can uh, detect the root and change the fruit. I remember him telling me many years after... Um, I just said, we're not doing food stamps anymore. If you want them, you go down there and get them. I remember that. He said, I remember my father always sending my mother to the door to handle salesmen, to handle phone calls he didn't want to handle, to deal with things he didn't want to deal with. So immediately that told me it's a good thing that I broke that cycle of having him to push me out instead of him stepping out to deal with it. I mentioned in a men's meet I did the other day, I remember a guy came in to, uh, he came in to fuss at my dad about something, and my dad sat there and took it, but my mom ran him out. So passivity was what I inherited also. So sometimes you wonder, why am I like this? And the very thing I judge my dad on almost caused me my marriage. Mm -hmm. And that was judging him about being so stingy that I was so stingy that she left me one time over a hamburger. No, I'm tr truthful. I think she wanted a fish sandwich, but it was 20 cent more. So she left me because I didn't want to pay 20 cent more. Now, this is not a joke. So He's serious. I judged my dad, and I became more like what he was mm -hmm. by judging him. And, and I'm... Between all this, I'm saying some things that you may be able to pick up and understand why you're like you are and why you're trying to succeed and wonder why I can't get over this hump. Sometimes because you never forgave or broke the cycle of who you judged in the past. Mm -hmm. The bitter root judgment that keeps following you, that I'm just like the man that I hated because he was always drunk. Mm -hmm. Or the man that always uh, never home. And you said, I would never treat my kids that way, but now you treat them that way. Mm -hmm. 
absolutely. So when we're looking at bitter root judgment, one of the um, things that I remember you talking about with your father about the stinginess, and that was one of the reasons why I pulled the outfit that I made when I was pregnant with my children. And I think that's some of the pain around having children because each time I conceived, it reminded him of money he had to spend. That's a trait of, of being a pauper, P-A-U-P-E-R, I think I spelled it correctly. A poor person, you always think when you bless somebody else, it's taking something from you. You get what I'm saying? It, it, you think, okay, now I got another child, now that's something I won't have. Mm. Uh, if I give this an offering, that's something I won't have. It's, it's the spirit that's behind a poverty spirit mm. that hampers your future. So it, it, it was always, okay, now it's this much growth to that kind of thing. And you don't say that, but subconsciously you have it in your mind, now somebody else is get ready to take something that I would have had. Let me add some purpose to why we're doing what we do today. The most read book in the world is the Bible. Did you know that? Has been, still is. The most read book. The Bible includes various genealogies from Adam, the first man, to Jesus Christ. So family history is important. Spiritual family history, natural family history. Because you are spiritual children, we're sharing our family history. And blended with that is the church family history, which we covered about two weeks ago. Church family history. If you know your history, you can change your future. If you know what made you the way you are, then you can change it. What you don't know can harm you. If you don't know what your parents' proclivities were, mm -hmm. if you didn't know why they were wired a certain way, I noticed that certain things that, as he talked about it, that cropped up in his family affected our family and affected our ministry. If you notice, he alluded to giving. And when it came to tithe, so the biggest battle we had was when I decided I was going to pay tithe off of his earnings and mine. So if you don't know the history, you don't know what is causing you to be blessed or what's causing you to be cursed or what's hindering you from being progressive. So it's very important when you understand what people have gone through, it helps you to refrain from judgment and it helps you to be a better individual. Looking at the things, why this person is this way does not give you a reason to be that way. One of the important things that I notice from time to time with each one of my children, but especially with Davern, she said, I would look at certain things that I saw and said, I don't want to judge that and I don't want to be that. If you don't address it, it will address you. Uh, one of the things that Bernard Jordan asked me, and I, the first picture that I chose was with him being in the Air Force because I remember right after we got married, he talked about his father uh, having cancer and his father's death. And I didn't realize how that impacted him until my brother was diagnosed with cancer. And it threw me into a crisis. I couldn't figure out why he was MIA. And I asked Bernard Jordan, what is the problem? What is the issue? And immediately Bernard Jordan said, how did he respond to death in his family? That will affect your marriage if you're here and you're single. If you're married, that will affect your children, unborn children. You need to know how people responded under certain conditions. Do you mind sharing that, the response, how that affected you with your father and the passing I, of I your father? I remember uh, he had cancer and it went all the way up to, they thought he had uh, tuberculosis or whatever, they had a tent. And uh, backing up, I remember him sleeping in the room next to him and he was groaning so at night that I couldn't sleep. So it was gotten to the point to said, God, just go ahead and take him because I can't take that. But then when he went to the hospital, I think I went once because I couldn't stand to see him that way. So yeah, it, it was devastating. Uh, and then when your brother died, it, it was, it's just still hard for me to go to the hospital and see people when it looked like they're dying. It, it throws me back to 
Wow, and, and that's really bad. As a pastor that's supposed to be going to pray for people, but sometimes you never know what affects your life from the very beginning. Whatever happened to you early that you don't get over will still hold on to you. Mm -hmm. So there'll be, I mean, somebody was talking to the other day, it's just, death can be something else. When you, um, I was just talking to a cousin, she said, I sit there and I saw my husband take his last breath, and then I went down and saw my brother take his last breath. So she's devastated that I saw two people die. You, you'd just be surprised at how your past can affect you, especially when it comes to death. So the fight is on, on how to fight these memories how to fight pain from memories. One of the things that we have to learn at the church is how to get healed from memories that are not good. How do I remember it and not have the pain of it? Right. So it's good to look it up, to Google it, and when you're Googling, be careful that you don't pull the wrong stuff up, but find out what makes you visualize, visualize what you visualize. What makes you, make you have images of what you have images of. Uh, yesterday, a bad thought hit my mind and I heard immediately, say something out loud to create a different image. And I said, wow, and I did it. You hear what I just said? The, the bad thought hit me, and that thought painted the image quickly. Immediately, I said something positive out loud. I'm in the room by myself, in my den, I said something out loud. It painted another image which covered that image. Now I see good and don't see the bad that came to my mind. So how did you get closure with the loss of your father before many, many years later having to for, deal for, with the for death of your mom? For years you don't get closure when you don't have teaching like that. We were in a ministry that didn't talk about things like this. So he died in 1972 probably. And you don't, hardly, you don't get closure when you don't know how to get closure. Mm. Just over the years and reading and learning how to reframe things. So reframing has very, been very important in my life. How do I reframe that? How do I, how do I make this a blessing rather than something that's harmful and hurtful? Mm 